Hello everyone and welcome back to Electronics Prepper, the channel where we try to learn as much as possible about electronics to become more self-reliant with technology and prepare for the future. In today's video I would like to talk to you about what is called passive power factor correction and power factor correction in general. So this is a topic that has been covered on YouTube several times, however I believe I can come with uh, slightly better explanations and more clearer explanations as to how we can um, apply this power factor correction and um, actual formulas to, to help us better because lately I've been uh, watching um, other videos and they are nice on a theoretical level but Practically, when it comes to actually calculating how many microfarads of capacitance you need to add uh, into a certain circuit in order to, you know, compensate for the uh, inductive load that that circuit has, um, many times you kind of find problems. You it, things are not so clear. So I've done my own research, um, both in other YouTube videos and. Uh, in, uh, in other places like um, articles on the internet I have uh, managed to understand the problem so um, I'm confident to uh, you know present to you this problem and the solutions in a way that um, hopefully is uh, better for you and will make you understand this problem better so um, let me start uh, by um, explaining why would we care about this problem in the first place and then we will move on to um, how this problem manifests, when, uh, what formulas we have and um, what to do on a concrete level. So um, ideally we would like to have resistive loads. Resistive loads are the kind of loads where the current that flows through them is uh, synchronized, is in phase with the voltage applied to them. However, uh, there are times when we will simply not have such a thing. For instance, if we take a transformer, medium power or high power transformer, such as the one that I'm putting on screen, this is recovered from a microwave oven, um, this video comes somewhat in continuation of the following, um, of the previous video where I've showed you how I've modified the microwave oven transformer to uh, better suit our needs. Um, well, if you power him uh, from, you know, from the wall, you will um, discover something. Uh, of course, if you power him through a panel meter that is able to show you voltage current and other things, then you will see um, a very not nice uh, phenomenon happening and this is something that we don't need to care here in society one while we still get our electricity from a company uh, from you know a very complex grid that uh, can typically take care of whatever imbalances happen but this is a phenomenon that we need to understand and take care of when we want to power our devices from our own sources, from UPS, from um, our own generators, from inverters, you know, uh, those of you who already have a, a solar panel installation, you have your own inverters, you do need to care about the efficiency of everything that you plug into that into those inverters because otherwise you will consume a much higher current which will pose some problems okay so if we take a look on the screen just to give a very simple example of when this problem manifests i've just connected uh, i have taken a, a microwave oven transformer i have not done anything to him He's still intact as I pulled him out of the microwave oven and I've just connected him to the power through a panel meter so that I can see what's going on. 
And what we see here is, um, well, we won't see this at first. We need to do some calculations. And once you do those calculations, um, <laughs> things will become uh, clear. So, um, before I move forward, I need to um, just make a quick recap of what uh, electrical powers are um, and a few calculations. But before even that, please allow me to thank the sponsor of this video, which is PCBWay. PCBWay is a leading PCB manufacturer that can help you build your dream projects no matter how advanced they are. They can create just the PCBs for you or help you as well solder components on them through PCB assembly services. If you're creating a full device, they can help you create a plastic case through either 3D printing or injection molding services or even CNC machining if you need custom metal pieces for a metallic case. You're free to use your favorite design software, upload the Gerber files and one of their professional representatives will contact you offering you one-on-one -on -one customer service. All you need to do is go to pcbway.com, the link is in the description. Thank you very much PCBWay for sponsoring this video. And now let's get started with understanding this problem with the power factor. So just a quick recap. Um, again, this has been covered on other YouTube videos, so I won't dive deeply into it. In alternative current, we have three different powers. In, the, in direct current, we only have one power and things are simple. But in alternative current, we have three different powers. Uh, notated with uh, the three letters S, P and Q. S is used for apparent power. It's the power that actually gets consumed from whatever power source you have, from the wall or from your own generator. P is the active power. It's the power that is actually useful and that actually does something concrete for us. And Q um, is what's called reactive power. It's basically a power that gets wasted and is the result of reactive components in our device, namely inductors or anything that has inductance or capacitors or anything that has capacitance. Due to the fact that those components um, introduce a delay, um, uh, a phase shift, as we call that, between the voltage that we apply to those devices, to those components, and the uh, current that flows through them, um, this reactive power appears. Now, when we have no reactive power whatsoever, it's as if this triangle is so small that for all practical purposes, he doesn't even exist. Uh, the active power is the same as the apparent power, so we have maximum efficiency, okay? And since we have a right angle triangle, uh, then um, uh, we also have uh, an angle between the apparent power and the, um, the active power. Uh, this angle is notated with the letter phi from uh, Greek alphabet, okay? And so, um, of course, co uh, according to Pythagoras' theorem, we can um, uh, find relations between all three um, uh, sides of the triangle. Sinus of phi is basically the reactive power divided by this uh, apparent power. And cosinus of phi is the um, uh, active power divided by this apparent power. Uh, in English terms, um, you don't seem to use cosinus of phi, you use the concept of power factor, which is this, um, this uh, ratio, okay? Uh, in um, East Europe and some other parts of the world, we don't... Um, use the term power factor so much we use the term cosinus of phi because well that's what he is literally cosinus of phi mathematically is this uh, active power over um, apparent power so why is it important like i said by just looking at him we can determine 
um, how efficient our device is. Ideally, this should be 1. Um, so, cosinus of phi or this power factor should equal 1. Practically, we will never be uh, in such a situation or almost never be in such a situation, but we need to be as close as 1 as possible. Anything, uh, you know, that is far from being 1 uh, represents some losses and some problems. So, um, if we take a look here on this panel meter, we can see that we have 214 volts, or at least that's uh, how much I had at that particular moment in time. And we can see that this transformer is drawing 1.84 amps. That's a lot. So, if we, div if we multiply 214 by 1.84, this gives us 300, almost 394 volt amps of apparent power. And this power is consumed constantly by our transformer to do nothing. What's worse than this is that the active power is only 43.7 watts. So, even... Uh, and, and, and considering we, we don't have a anything connected to the transformer's output this is just pure wasted power however what's worse is that uh, we are actually wasting almost 10 times more power than the actual wasted power of the transformer himself okay so if we want to calculate the power factor here we just divide this 43.7 uh to this 393 0.76 and we get a power factor of 0 0.11 which is absolute garbage it's normal i mean it happens naturally but it's garbage and we need to do something about it and um now this power factor will change when we will apply a load especially after we um, modify the transformer like we have seen in the previous video and we apply loads this power factor will uh, will tend to become better but he will still all by himself he will not get anywhere near one we need to do something about it so this is what i'm saying this is going to be a big problem if you have um, a device created with uh, such a transformer plugged directly into your own power source let's say a solar panel inverter or a, a, a gasoline generator or whatever he will literally consume 10 times more than he needs to okay and when it comes to off-grid living obviously <laughs> this is a problem that we need to address so um Let's see what we can do about it by basically understanding the, the general theory. For that, I will use MicroCap, which is free software uh, available on the internet uh, to simulate some circuits and to quickly present to you some uh, basic concepts and then to see what we can do about them. So what we have here in what i have just shown you is essentially a voltage source an alternative current voltage source that i have set for 220 volts uh, rms which is 311 volts peak 50 hertz because that's what i have in my country okay applied to um an inductor i um i, I don't have here an actual transformer because i don't really care for simplicity's sake, I only have an inductor. I have chosen 70 millihenry, more or less um, um, arbitrarily. And we also have a resistor here, but for the moment we will ignore him. He's got zero ohms, so it's as if he doesn't exist. We also have a capacitor here, but we also ignore him because he has the color gray because he's disabled. Okay, we will enable him later. So we only have this power source, this voltage source and the inductor. Well, if we run a transient analysis, we will see that the current, which is with red, is 90 degrees out of phase uh, relative to the voltage applied. This is nothing new. We already knew this. I'm just, you know, 
quickly mentioning these things to be clear about what it is that we're talking. So a 90 degrees phase shift means that whenever we have maximum voltage, we have um, an average current in this particular case, or in some other cases, let's see, um, we might even have zero uh, current. Okay, let me let me make this simulation closer to what you um, might find in other places. Anyhow, um, when we have maximum current, on the other hand, we have a much smaller voltage and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, let me get back. Okay, so maximum current uh, is at the point where we have zero volts and maximum voltage is at the point where we have um, we, we kind of have zero or close to zero current and so on and so forth this is why there's such a discrepancy between the, the apparent power the, the power that is actually consumed and um, uh, active power that is actually able to do something because when we have uh, you know maximum voltage but zero current we have zero power when we have maximum current but zero voltage we also have zero power so there's nothing we can do with that power because it's zero okay on the other hand a capacitor um, behaves similarly but in the opposite direction okay so if we um, disable this and enable the capacitor and run the exact same simulation we find a similar thing but in reverse okay um, we find that whenever we have maximum voltage we have zero current and whenever we have a, a minimum or a maximum current we have zero voltage so again a purely capacitive load is wasteful because um, um, we have so many moments that we have zero power and yet we are drawing cor current from our power source okay most of the times we will find ourselves having an inductive load and we need to compensate that with a capacitor i don't think we will find ourselves uh, the other way around so <clears throat> we uh, have to go back to some basic stuff and mention briefly the fact that um, you know in, in such circuits where we have a capacitor and an inductor with or without resistance um, matters less we basically need to deal with uh, reactances impedances okay so the the formula just to quick uh, remind you the formulas for uh, reactances which are basically the equivalent of resistances but in alternative current for coils and for, for inductors and capacitors are as follows the um, reactive uh, the in inductive reactance is 2 pfl where f is the frequency and l is uh, you know the inductance and the capacitive reactance is the inverse, so 1 over 2 pfc, so f frequency c capacitance in farads. Okay. So whenever we have a circuit that has a strong component of one type, let's say inductive component, it is clear that in order to compensate that, we need to add a capacitor because the capacitor adds... Uh, the opposite um, delay, the opposite phase shift, but we need to make sure that their reactances are the same in uh, case number one. In case number two, when we have uh, in our circuit both inductance and resistance, we need to take the resistance into account because, of course, the resistance will... Um, change the impedance of this right side of the circuit however the capacitor will only uh, compensate for the phase shift induced by the inductor because the resistor 
uh, or the resistance of the circuit uh, does not introduce phase shift. Okay, so this is why we have slightly different formulas, but um, if we look carefully, we will see that they are essentially one and the same. This is just a formula where resistance equals zero, and therefore if uh, we have R equals zero, resistance squared over whatever inductance is also zero, so this thing simply uh, gets to be eliminated, and this formula gets to be simplified to be this formula, one over four P squared F squared L. Okay, so I won't bore you with all the details of how I managed to get to this particular formula. It's safe to say that, uh, you know, we start from uh, the reactance of uh, each component. Um, we end up having the uh, resonating frequency, which is the point where both reactants are equal. Um, and the resonating frequency is 1 over 2p uh, square root of Lc. Uh, um, and you know, from further calculations, we can uh, we can um, extract uh, these formulas. Also, in in this second case, where we want to uh, let's say we we have a resistance that is not negligible, so we don't want to just consider her zero. Um, then we we basically calculate what's the impedance of this uh, portion, and that needs to be the same as the impedance of this capacitor. Of course, impedance depends on reactance, which in turn depends on frequency, and this is why um, this is one of the reasons why it's called passive power factor correction, because we are using a passive component and we are correcting only for a very particular frequency. If the frequency were to shift, uh, our um, our circuit will become imbalanced again. Okay, So, this is how I managed to get to these formulas. Uh, if we only have a capacitor and an inductor, then the formula is 1 over 4 P squared F squared L. If we also have a resistance, then it's 1 over uh, root squared over L plus 4p squared f squared l. This is how we know exactly how much capacitance do we need in the circuit. And this is one of the things that sadly in other videos on YouTube tends to not be mentioned. Um, other videos tend to go in other directions with the calculations, but they don't really end up having an actual value for these capacitors. And this is important because, after all, without having an actual value, we cannot perform the actual compensation. Okay. Before I move forward to the third case, which is a more particular case, um, let me show you um, some uh, simulations, you know, just to see what we're talking about. So, uh, let me run the simulation again. Like I said, if we only have the inductive load, then we will have this phase shift of uh, current versus uh, voltage. So if we calculate, uh, and in this particular case, we have resistance zero. If we calculate with this simplified formula for uh, 70 millihenry of inductance, we get that we need to have uh, 140 microfarads of capacitance. And if we activate this capacitor with this correct value, then our current gets to be a flat line. This is because we are doing a simulation that by her nature is a, uh, basically an, a perfect circuit that has no other losses and nothing else is happening, okay? So, when we have compensated such a circuit correctly, we have our current a completely flat line all across um, the waveform of the voltage. So, we have achieved basically uh, a power factor of 1, which is ideal. Now, it's important to know at least approximately what the right value of this capacitance needs to be because if we add a too small capacitance, let's say, I don't know, 20 micro, we see that, yeah, we are performing uh, a, 
uh, a bit of a compensation but not much okay if we add more capacitance we see even more compensation but again we are not quite there yet on the other hand if we add too much capacitance let's say 200 micro we see that we are starting to have a circuit that behaves more capacitively so we still have losses we still have phase shift but in the opposite direction this is why we want to know exactly how much capacitance do we need to add and this is why we we want to have these formulas now if we um, let's say we have some uh, resistance in our circuit that we need to take into account i don't know i'm just gonna put a wild value of 100 ohms um then uh, without uh, or let, let me just disable this capacitor at all um or maybe yeah okay 100 ohms is a bit too much uh let's see uh okay 20 ohms seems ah, okay ish um so we see that uh, the waveform of the current uh, has dropped a little bit. Uh, we also have some negative values now. And we, we see that we still have phase shift. Okay, The more a re resistance we would have in our circuit, the less the phase shift we would have because the less inductive our circuit would become. However, when we still have some phase shift, okay, we use this other formula. And I'm going to use an Excel table that I have on the side. So for 50 hertz, 70 micro Henry, I have 20 uh, ohms. Okay, so this capacitor needs to be 79 micro farads. So I'm going to activate this capacitor and set him to 79 micro. Okay, and now we have achieved correction. Why? I mean, when is this correction done? Well, uh, this correction is done even though we don't no longer have a flat line and we can no longer have a flat line from now onwards because we have this resistance. Um, we do have a corrected power factor because the maximum point of the voltage coincides with the maximum point of the current. And also the point where uh, they are zero is one and the same. At the same time, they are both zero um, immediately before falling into negative values or rising into positive values. So now we have both the current and the uh, voltage in phase. Again, if we would add too much capacitance, then we would um, have a, an out of phase. If we would have too little we would have out of phase as well okay and in order to um in order to make things uh even more clear let me give uh, get back to what i had earlier um i'm going to run an ac analysis okay with both um, axis logarithmic to make it easier for us to see. And I'm going to take a look at the impedance of each piece of the circuit. So the impedance of the capacitor with blue and the impedance of the inductor with uh, red. So because we have uh, a circuit with a resonant frequency of 50 Hertz, because this is how we calculated him, um, we see that this 50 Hertz is exactly the point where the two impedances match of these two capacitors, of these two components, okay? And at the same time, this is the reason why uh, at this point we have corrected power factor. They uh, in introduce a phase shift that is opposed to each other, so they cancel each other and at the same time they have the same impedance so they stay balanced okay if i were to uh, change this then the frequency would also shift and of course uh, the impedances would also shift 
Okay. Now, um, let's go to the third situation because these two situations will um, will not we will not find ourselves in these two situations quite so often because this this implies that we will know the uh, the the amount of inductance that we have in our circuit um and maybe also the amount of resistance that we have sometimes maybe we can measure that most of the times we probably won't be able to measure that however um just like i showed you uh in this particular circuit in this par particular example we can much easily use this kind of panel meter, which, by the way, you can find uh, online. Just search for something like panel meter, ammeter, or something like that, and you will find him in, in, in various uh, online shops. Um, it's, it's affordable enough. Um, such a device shows you some values and based on these values you will have to calculate the amount of capacitance that you need um, i personally haven't seen any video so far um, related to that so most often like i said we will find ourselves in this situation when we will be able to measure the apparent power we will be able to measure or just directly see the um, active power and based on this, we need to calculate the capacitance. Again, I'm not going to bore you with all the details uh, of how I uh, use these formulas to, to get to this formula. But it's safe to say that the capacitance in this particular case is the square root of the difference between the squares of the um, apparent power and the um, active power. Everything divided over 2PF uh, U squared, where U is the voltage, okay? We, in, in this part of the world, we use U and it makes a lot more sense. V is for volts, U is for voltage, uh, not uh, anything else. So, in my case, the voltage that was applied to my transformer was 214 volts, okay? S, the apparent power, is the uh, product between 214 volts and 1.84 amps. And uh, P, the, the, the active power, in my case, I was able to just read that 43.7 directly from the screen. F is the frequency with which we work, and it's a known frequency in my country, 50 hertz, in others might be 60 and this formula tells us exactly, you know, what capacitor we need to put. Now, in case you're wondering where this does this square root comes from, well, it's very simple. Like I said, with this capacitor, we are trying to uh, mitigate the problems introduced by this reactive power. And according to Pythagoras' theorem, you know, one uh, cathet is... Um, uh equal to the square root of the um, difference between the hypotenuse squared and the other cathet squared so this is why we see this uh upper part of this division uh radical of s squared minus p squared this is literally q the reactive power okay this is how we can calculate that. So it's reactive power over 2PF voltage squared. So to get back to my uh, concrete example, if I use um, this formula with these values, so let's see, 214 volts, 43.7 watts, um, I have uh, a power, uh, an apparent power of 390 or ish um, uh, volt amps and the formula okay so this formula tells me that i need to have 27 microfarads of capacitance now do bear in mind that uh, on such a load your uh, inductance will slightly uh, vary your impedance will slightly vary um, while you are operating the circuit or the device 
Uh, and of course, in that case, um, you will need to take some other measurements and make sure that they still match to a certain degree, um, you know, your initial calculations. I'm going to show you something concrete that I've also shown you in, um, in the previous video. So uh, in the previous video, I've shown you how I've modified this uh, microwave oven transformer. Now, as you can see here on this panel meter, while I was drawing quite a bit of power from him, um, the values are changed. I'm going to jump a little bit forward. Okay. This is why uh, you see in this video, in this image, on the left side of my blue multimeter, I also have something that looks like a blue box. Well, that blue box was actually a huge capacitor. Okay, this kind of capacitor, I needed to just make some Photoshop uh, changes to this portion so I can clearly show you the values uh, written on him because on the camera the values were uh, almost uh, not uh, visible at all. So I used a 40 microfarad capacitor, 1100 volts, just because I didn't have anything else, um, you know, at hand. So uh, for me, a 40 microfarad capacitor was actually a better value in order to compensate for the power that I was drawing, okay? So now getting back to the panel meter uh, when my transformer was uh, power factor corrected with this 40 microfarad capacitor, uh, and I was drawing quite a bit of power, we see different values and we can calculate that I've accomplished a pretty good, um, pretty good compensation. So, um, if we take the previous formula and we uh, add everything, I'm going to add it in, a, in an Excel file that I have on my side, 210 volts, um, active power 731.7 uh watts and uh apparent power 210 volts multiplied by 3.64 amps uh this gives us um basically a power factor of about 0 0.95 or so okay so uh 731.7 watts divided by 210 volts multiplied by 3.64 amps uh, 0 0.957 so 0 0.96 uh, power factor which is pretty close to 1 okay now um we can uh, since now i have the capacitor in circuit I cannot use this uh, formula anymore in order to calculate. Um, you would need to, to use this formula without a capacitor at all. I have used this one before and um, the value was near 40 microfarads. This is why I used the 40 microfarads capacitor. And as we can see, you know, I have uh, corrected the power factor pretty well. So this is how you do things these are the formulas i hope now you understand things better and you have um, something much more concrete with which you can work uh, like i said to reiterate it's important to take care of the power factor correction in order to be able to use your inverters or your generators properly so that uh, they don't break um, or they don't reach their power limit earlier than they should and hopefully also so you can prolong the lifespan of your uh, your solar installation or whatever other means of uh, producing your own electricity you have okay so this is pretty much it i hope you've enjoyed this and now you've learned something new Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for uh, those who are supporting this uh, project on Patreon. 
uh, link is in the description if you would like to support me to be able to learn things faster and perform um, experiments um, easier and faster you can do so um, financially in patreon link otherwise for free you can uh, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you can allow the youtube algorithm to um, see that my content is valuable and potentially recommend my videos to other people as well thank you very much and we will see each other again in the next video bye bye mm -hmm.